So good morning, everyone. My name is Fawn Catherine Washizi. Uh, my Lakota name is Shunhizi Oda Agliwi, which means she brings many buckskin horses. Um, I was named, both my English and my Lakota name, I've been named after my great-grandmother, Catherine Agard. Um, I am traditionally, my families are from Kennel, South Dakota and Bullhead, South Dakota, but I was raised in Fort Yates, North Dakota. Um, I am at home right now in the heart of Old Sioux Village, a little neighborhood that we call Old Sioux Village. I am, I have, I wear a number of hats in my life. Um, I was a biologist for Standing Rock Sioux Tribe for 10 plus years. And then I, um, they were in desperate need of science and math teachers. So they recruited me for Fort Yates Middle School and I'm a, been a math teacher there for the past couple of years, which I really love. I never thought I would love teaching, but I love teaching and summers off is a plus. Um, so biologist, um, math teacher, and I am the chairwoman of Sage Development Corporation. So, and our project here is called Ambetui, which means um, the time of day, um, when the sun comes up, the breaking of a new day, which is a really powerful time for us Lakota, Dakota people. And one reason we chose that as a project development name was because, because of that powerful time of day and that uh, we want this to become a new start for Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, for the Standing Rock people. Um, I was at No Dapple. Um, I, am, I consider myself a water protector um, I wasn't so much involved because I had a job at the time and I had to make sure the land was taken care of at the same time. Um, but I, I do consider myself a water protector and I'm very happy that um, my people led the fight against No Dapple. Um, so I'm going to move on and I'll ask my panelists here. All my panelists are with the Mini Wichoni. Nakichizi Waunspe, the Defenders of the Water School. Hopefully, I'm not a Lakota language teacher, so I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, guys. But uh, let's start off with Elena Eagleshield. You did good. I was going to lili. Midak yapi, Elena Eagleshield, amach yapi, iu ha chante washtena pe chus api, hocho ka kudepi wi hemia, Io slaha ekta imacha re, um, Ichinchaki Yamini, Tewichawaki Hila, uh, Mahasani Red Rock Perkins, a Chiapi, Naha, Atewayaki, John Eagleshield Senior Chiapi, Naha, Inawayaki, Valerie Eagleshield, the Chiapi. Oh, uh, so it's good to be here. My name is Elena Eagleshield. I'm from Standing Rock. Uh, my Lakota name is Hochoka Kudepiwi, which means shoots at her in the midst or in the middle. I come from Standing Rock, and uh, I also wear a few hats, a hey, couple of beaded ones, hey. but we're, <laughs> I'm really thankful to be here with the team. Uh, Sunshine and Kamimala are amazing Lakota women in our communities that have been doing amazing work with the school and other projects, uh, and we just wanted to we're, we're very thankful to have this platform to share about the, the, the school and the work that's happening as well as the Mini Wichoni Clinic and Farm and just the things that we want to see for our community. And we invite each and every one of you um, who are from Standing Rock or who want to support our efforts to reach out to us and um, yeah, just share whatever knowledge you have and we're willing to collaborate. Um, but yeah, very good to be here. Kilame. Absolutely. Thank you, Elena. Kimimila, uh, how about you? Kimimila, how about you? La coma chaje, giato, et anavik chak chijui, ia was lotta himataha. Good morning, everybody. I'm good to be here. Um, my name is Kimimila in Lakota. Um, and my Lakota name is She Flies to Defend Her Nation. Um, I'm from and live here on Standing Rock, a agency town too. Hey, but I'm from the South Side. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kind of South Side <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that too, actually. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, just um, just 
wanting change and trying to do as much as I can here on Standing Rock. Um, we actually have many topics to cover, so I'm just going to keep my introduction really short. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Kamimila. Um, Sunshine, will you please introduce yourself? And uh, my name is Sunshine Rose, and my Lakota name is Woman Who Walks in a Good Way. And I am a graduate from Sitting Bull College at, in Environmental Science. And now I am a regenerative land management coordinator for a nonprofit called Earth Activist Training. Uh, Kimimala invited me to this project to help teach, and now I'm in for the long haul, and I'm really happy and grateful for this team of collaboration. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you ladies for being here with us today. Um, I have a couple topics I'd like to discuss. Um, and if we could just kind of go around and each of you take your turn on it. Um, so what does Waniwi Ikba, the winter solstice mean for the Dakota Lakota people? And if you can also describe the meaning of Miniwichoni and the importance of protecting the earth and all of its inhabitants. Uh, Lena, why don't we start with you? <laughs> I think it's um, it's really cool to think about the the projects that we're doing in the school that we're building because these are things that I think well you know Camila and I we grew up around um, Lala Tretanka and Fawn grew up around Lala Tretanka Iotake's um, Sundance and so thinking of all the mm -hmm. teachings that we gained there we did have to kind of live in two worlds. And when I was growing up, I didn't fully understand that because I felt like, well, I'm not getting in trouble for speaking my language or going to ceremonies or, you know, like I'm not, I don't have to risk doing that. So why do I, you know, I don't understand how I'm still living in two worlds. But I think because of the ways that we were raised through like the underground generation and, and the ways that they um, had those teachings of, of, not really explicitly explaining things, but we had to observe and, and understand in that way that there was a lot of teachings that were passed to us that the rest of our, our peers and community didn't necessarily get. And so we were really privileged in that way. And so when I think of like the winter solstice or the summer solstice or, you know, like our New Year's or the things that are important to our people, I just think of how important it is for us to be sharing those things with our with our youth and our communities and because we weren't um it wasn't something that was lived every day within our communities and so when i think back to growing up in in our traditional ways i think i i'm seeing it now how we were had to separate and like be be current what was it decompartmentalize um our traditional ways with our are every day like on the res. And so I think um, thinking of this school, thinking of what the winter solstice is and, and why it's so important for us to be having this conversation today, I'm really grateful and thankful that we could be creating a school and a clinic and community with the wind farm and all these other projects on Standing Rock, the Standing Rock Community Development Corporation, all of these different projects programs and organizations that are bringing our ways back to the forefront and and not having us um okay, have it be the second world i need to log off and oh sorry <laughs> <Some second>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you elena um yeah that's very interesting that you how you yeah. describe that living in two Maria, worlds um that's just it's such, I think back on my life and it's such a privilege to have grown up the way I have, you know, it's like, why was I chosen for this life? It, it's a difficult life, but it's, it's a beautiful life. Um, when you think, when you talked about living in two worlds, I talked, I thought of my dad right away because, you know, he grew up, um, not seeing a actual vehicle till he was 10 years old. He grew up in old kennel, South Dakota. And he was on horse and a horse and team his most of his childhood. And um, his he was raised by his oldest grandchild, raised by his grandparents. And but they refused to teach him the language because they said, 
this is no longer our world. It is the Washichu, the white man's world. Now, I, we want you to get educated and to be able to live in that white man's world. So that's how, you know, trying to mesh. Now we're going back and be like, oh, I wish, you know, dad knew his language. It would have made life so much easier on my generation. But it's a decision that was made generations ago um, for us. Um, so thank you, Elena, for describing it that way. Um, Kamimila, why don't we move on to you? Again, I feel like, um, um, so, <laughs> trying to figure out how to tie this all together because it's all connected. Like, this yeah. is all part of our healing. This is all part of our decolonizing. This is all part of, um, you know, how um, Mitra talked about how we always felt like we had to live in separate worlds when, you know, when we prepared after work, we go and prepare for a ceremony. And then, you know, in the summertime, we're like rushing around in the evening, you know, um, getting ready to go camping and setting camps, setting things down there. And so we all grew up that way, you know, going to ceremony. We always had this idea that it was separate. But one of the things that we saw at camp was that, um, and this is, you know, this is where, I guess we're just realizing we can continue because we have the sovereignty, but we saw at camp <clears throat> this opportunity to, um, to people, for people to self-actualize. And what does that mean? That means people, for young people, old people, you know, all people, nobility, you know, the nobility of character and the ability of spirit. We saw people who were able to look within, figure out their strengths, and then bring that forward to the community. And what colonization tells us is that um, only if you only if you follow, you know, get these paper, only if you do this structure, only if you follow this entire colonized system, um, then you are a successful person. And what we're trying to do is get away from that, because that's what colonization colonization is. The way I look at it is this whole idea of separating so we can consume and be you know, operate like parasitically in, in the world. And what I mean by that, and you, you know, like I know that all of you here are, are grounded in the idea of mitakuye owasi. And that means we're all related. <clears throat> and the back, you know, the, the, that connection is, is like everything, all humans, we're one human aspect in, in, you know, in the creation. We're connected to the stars. We come from the stars. We're connected to the earth. We come from the earth. We're related to all the relatives, the animal relatives, the plant relatives. Um, that's what mitake yosema means. So then if you try to decolonize, and if you translate that into Lakota, that, that means ki Lakota. And ki Lakota then means to become human again. So then when we created that word, that, that means that somebody who, somebody who said, if you're colonized, that means you're forgetting what it means to be a good relative. You're forgetting what it means to be human, to your place, your gifts, your nobility. You're forgetting all of that so you can operate parasitically and consume and take and capitalize and and time is money, money is time, and be productive and be, you know, like be part of this industrialized revolution. And I can go on and on on a tangents on this, but we have it within us to completely dismantle this entire system, rebuild our own because we're that bad. <laughs> I almost cursed, but we're that awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we're that awesome that we could totally reconstruct it. And um, now is our time. Now is the time to do that. Hey, there's my soapbox. But yeah. <laughs> yeah we have a few, um, like a chat says, go, go, go. That's, that's that life we live in now. But us Lakota, Dakota people, we have that when we acknowledge Midakuyase, all my relatives, it centers us to the earth. We are grounded on the earth. And now that's what these people that are, you know, go, 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 like move, move, move. We have that... Um, that huge work ethic in American culture that they're coming back to that. They're finding meditation and trying to figure out why is my life so crazy? And they're trying to find a way to ground themselves and us Lakota, Dakota, we, we have that already. We just, we need to teach on how to, 
um, acknowledge that relationship with the world. Um, thank you, Kimi Mila. Uh, Sunshine? I appreciate everybody's vision here. And that's, for me, an uh, important aspect of the solstice is, is our time to slow down and reflect on where we've come from to this moment in time and this journey and, and to get collectively envision how we want to step into the future together and what we want for generations. And, and one thing like, um, you know, we're considering all of our relations and interacting with the plants, the animals, the rocks, but also um, in years to come. And how are things gonna be in 200 years from now? And how can we benefit the people that come after us? Even if we, uh, in this society, we're used to instant gratification. The internet is at our fingertips and all the information we need can come so quickly. So we don't have as much patience to wait for things to grow, even if we don't directly benefit for, from them. And I feel reflecting on these projects um, with this team, I know that even though we are benefiting from envisioning this together, I feel like uh, it's a shift into our collective for our future generations to uh, reactivate their um, connection to our plan planet that has been uh, the abundant supply of all of our needs and, and re reflecting on how we can work in this relationship and, and heal the degradation that has been imposed on our society and our land because of the modern practices, but how we, we can bridge these modern practices with traditional beliefs to help move our people forward in a good way. Absolutely, thank you, Sunshine. Um, what I would like to do now is, um, can you guys just give us some general information on the school? Um, basically, you, you developed a mini Wichoni school out at Ocheti Shakoi camp during the no dapple times. And um, how, it, how is it developing into a school um, right now in today's society? Uh, Elena, do you want to start? Keep trying to pass it to me. <laughs> just kidding. But, um, <laughs> So we, so during the camp, when everything was started, one of the main things that we wanted was to, to share with the youth um, in the community and also all of the Standing Rock districts. Um, we wanted them to see, see the camp for themselves, be able to be a part of history and to experience all the different tribes that were coming together. And in the beginning, it was, you know, just the Ocheti Shakoni and maybe a few other tribes. Um, and so anyways, we, we were trying to organize like how people could be sharing with the youth that do come out there. What are the, what are the knowledges and the tribes and the histories that are in that one place? And um, so we were basically going from camp to camp and just asking what they knew, like if they knew, you know, their history or their language or stories or artwork or whatever it was that they wanted to share if they're willing to do that um, on behalf of the Lakota Dakota people uh, and it it was amazing we got to see all the different people that were in camp in the beginning and we got to um, you know meet relatives that maybe we hadn't met or hadn't seen in a long time like I know you know almost everybody in the camp knew or heard of my dad or heard of you know all of your parents and and so it was really cool to see that coming together. Um, and then quickly there, there started to become meetings with like, you know, the aunties and the grandmas organizing their own meetings. And the first thing that came up was that we needed a space for kids. And you know how aunties and grandmas get. And so they basically were like, okay, may, create, a, create a space for the, for the kids. And I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> didn't know how to say no. And so we we and and it obviously wasn't really respectful either and so what we ended up doing was was organizing again with the families that were in the camp asking if they were you know going to be there for a while created a a homeschool space got a lot of support from in the camp but also families who wanted to be to be there and have their kids be a part of it and so the students ended up naming the school which at the time um Lexi uh, our my Lexi, our Lexi, Virgil taken alive, um, translated it for the students, and they wanted it to be the protectors of the water school. Um, and he described that defenders would be the appropriate word. So the defenders of the water school, um, 
he told us was the mini Wichoni Nakichiji Oaiwa. And then later on, as our school is developing, we realized that Oaiwa was a coined word that means like a school building. Um, and we felt like Wounspe was more appropriate um, for like a space of learning, which could happen anywhere. And it doesn't have to be in a building and it usually never is in a building. Um, and so we, um, we named it now the Mini Wichoni Nakichiji Wounspe. Uh, and that's how we've been moving forward is having the language guide it, just like uh, Chuek Mimala described Kila Kota and Midakuye Owasin. Most of those words that we use to describe our school don't necessarily have English translations, but they're teachings that we have been given and guided throughout our lives. And so we're really being particular and specific about how we name things and how we move forward um, with the namings. Like, you know, if, if we are going to say Midakuye Owasin, what does that mean? Is is that just for our own people? Is that for all people of color becoming relatives again? What does that look like? Um, because of, again, uh, Chua talked about colonization and how that has, you know, done so much damage in our communities. And it's also separated us and it separated us from each other where we even impose things like blood quantum and all these things on our own, you know? And so, um, so yeah, that, that's how it started in the camp. And then you too, if you want to jump in and talk about how it's developing now, because it's been really beautiful. It's, um, it's really hard to summarize, isn't it? <laughs> so, so it had took its roots at camp, but what, what was discovered, as, as I said before, was um, just this degree of self-actualization. You know, yes, there were people who were degreed and people who have all the pa proper paperwork, but it was this recognition of teachers are everywhere. Like elders are teachers, young people are teachers. There was master carvers there and they're teenagers. Those are all teachers. And we're so colonized in this system that we believe because, you know, again, they didn't have that paperwork that they're not a teacher. And so it's, it's this whole idea of shifting back to that, the nobility of character, the nobility of spirit understanding that we, I mean, before the colonizers arrived, colonizers arrived here, we as Lakota, the Lakota women sitting here, we would, nobody could have told us that we couldn't educate our kids. Nobody could have told us that. That, I, you know, I birthed that child, that child is going to be educated by myself and my family, you know, and fully grounded in that. And that's what colonization took away from us is that we can't do that. So we're coming back to that, we're grounding ourselves in that. And, um, you know, and part of that, uh, we, we were, um, when we were like creating the agenda for this, there was this question of what's your title? And um, I actually really struggled with that. Like I really struggled with these titles because by saying this is my title, people, I don't, I do not want people to say, this is so and so school. This is their school. This is them doing that, because then it's gonna fail. It's absolutely gonna fail, and and that and you see it time and time again. You see people who allow ego to get into it, and they allow those titles to get to their head, and then and then it takes over, and then people feed into that too. Oh, that's them doing that. That's their school, or that's their project, and they just let them do it. And then you have the burnout and you have all, you like, I see the cycle and I'm like, okay, we have to stop this cycle. That's so how can we stop it? If we stop it, we, we can stop it by all taking ownership. These are our children. These are our next generation. We are intelligent people, Lakota people. We're, we're so intelligent. I mean, we survived here in, on the Northern, Northern Plains, negative 60, negative 70, just, you know, chilling in a tent. So guys, you know, that was us like that. That's how amazing we are still. Yeah. And to get back to that and to recognize that, that we're fully capable of, of, of um, educating our children. I feel like I went on a whole rant and didn't really explain how we're going to do that. But um, do you want to help? Do that yeah. yeah. <laughs> so for me, basically, as a mother of a young child, since my child was like two years old, people were like, so what are you going to do when they go to school? Because we're nomadic. I move seasonally and that's the way I've been most of my adult life. And that's what I choose. But 
for me, I bring my child everywhere and I go to class with my child with me. So I lead us taking syntax, linguistics, permaculture, regenerative courses, because the people who host these sessions allow me to be a mother and they don't separate that. Like my child doesn't deserve to be in the classroom, which is important because now this child can progress in their own life with the support of their community and not feel like they don't deserve these, um, these knowledge just as much. Um, so uh, how I also envision the school um, is being a, a facility, a, a, a space, not a, a building, but the land being a space where children can find sanctuary in their culture and not feel like they have to hide their culture anymore, but really express themselves to the, their own vision of who they want to be and follow their dreams and how we as elder guides can help mentor them to find the right people in the community and develop those projects that they see fit rather than saying, this is what you guys need to do as young people, but letting them find their own solutions and, and um, using that creative, innovative mind that we all are capable of. And so uh, one of the, one of the um, envisions for it is a lot of food sovereignty because um, we know as people how much our, our food, our, our um, natural diet that was indigenous to the land was a lot more aligned with good health than some of the, the colonized and government provisions that were imposed on the people because of the loss of resources that was impacted by colonialization. For our people on Standing Rock in the late 50s, the um, Pix Loan Act flooded our riverbeds and turned our river into a lake which drowned our fertile food valleys that uh, stories I hear of my grandmother horseback riding through Walker Bottom where there was abundant food and she would never have to come home because all day the land provided what she needed. And um, now I feel like there's this disconnect and lack of trust in the land because we can't, we can identify more corporate labels than we can plants that could feed us in our territory often. And that's um, important to shift and um, have people be able to trust ourselves and bring back fertility to our land because once the dam flooded our territory, our people were moved to the hard clay pan that was around the river and it was harder to grow food on and harder to sustain ourselves. So the government provisions of um, you know, flour and sugar and all those things caused a lot of health effects for multiple generations and now, us as reflective individuals, we see and are connecting the dots and how our, our diet has changed and that our health has changed and how we can reincorporate these um, traditional practices through uh, drying, processing our own meat, saving and preserving our own food from the gardens and, and sharing that with our community and not, not only thinking about how we can provide ourselves sustenance for the winter, but how we can collaborate and have enough for everybody to be fed. Great, thank you, Sunshine. I really appreciate your sentiments because I, I can tell you're very passionate about this because you're kind of getting like choked up here. So I, I really thank you for attending and um, let, let, letting us know your, your thoughts and feelings on this. Um, if You know, I just want to put in there, anyone that is attending right now, if you would please, um, if you have any questions for us, please drop those into the chat if you're uh, willing to. Um, so basically, like, as I told you guys, I'm a fifth and sixth grade math teacher right now in a middle school. And um, one of the problems that we come across is um, we know the kids, the students, we, they love learning about our Lakota, Dakota ways, and they have such immense um, respect for it. I have, my brother is, teaches in the same school. He's the Lakota language culture teacher, Courtney Yellowcat. And, um, you know, every winter, like right before break, he will tell the story, the long story that was taught to him by um, the looking horses, the bringing of the sacred pipe. And he puts in there the actual songs and everything. So it takes a good, I mean, a little over an hour 
to tell the story. And our students are sitting there quiet, just listening, taking it all in. And that is just unprecedented. You know, we have, a, when I teach math, it's hard to keep, keep everyone's attention. But when our Lakota ways come up, you know, they are ready and willing and they're wanting that knowledge. Um, and another thing too, is we have, um, we want to talk about, you know, what does, what is your Lakota name? What is your Dakota name? Where does your family come from? Um, do you know what band you come from? Because I've been lucky my whole life, you know, in my introduction, I named, you know, I can name my Kiyosh by a, um, and that's pretty much how I, I'm related to Elena and Kinimila distantly is we all come from the same Kiyosh by a, the same area. Um, but when our problem is some of our students are foster kids, their parents were never taught anything. And so they can't relate to that. They're like, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm Lakota or Dakota, you know, and I can tell them, I like, based on your last name, you're Dakota, you know, but um, they love learning that stuff. But for some of them, it's a little, almost a little traumatic. It's, um, I don't know anything. They have nothing to root themselves to Ujimaka, to Grandmother Earth. And so I think that's very important for having this school. Um, because this school can actually pr help provide them that with that and bring in elders from those specific communities to explain, you know, based on your last name, you are a Dakota, you're um, a Hanktawa or whatever, and this is what your last name means. This is, these are some Lakota or Dakota names from your family, stuff like that, and just help root our children to, so they know where they come from. They, because they can just say, oh, I'm from Port Yates. But when they understand traditionally where they're from, what their people sacrificed to get them where they are today, you know, it's going to make them stronger, stronger citizens in the long run. Um, so thank you guys. Um, so uh, from what I'm understanding, um, your, the school isn't a traditional school where you have math science. Well, maybe math science. It's um, because I actually got um requested to teach in uh immersion school math and i was like i i'm not sure how i can how would i say 1125 you know i know my numbers in lakota but to rattle off like in lakota they get kind of long it's easier to say them in english <laughs> um so but it's not it's i'm gonna say it's a traditional ecological knowledge school am i right in that yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. more and much yes. more. Yes, and much more. Okay. <laughs> and much more. Yeah. So um I don't I don't want to hijack if you have any more, but no, go just ahead. To add to that, um I'll give you an example. So we're it's getting away from the idea that there is a teacher who is deciding what other people shouldn't have to know. And it's it's um and what I mean by that, let me give you, let me give you a very specific, specific example. Um, a couple of weeks ago, some, a couple of us, you know, we got together and we, um, you know, we butchered a buffalo. It would be that same, that same idea of students, you know, saying, okay, this is the needs of our community. This, 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 by doing this, it will create these many solutions. Let's do that. But in that process, um, they're, you know, the students, you know, the students are in charge of their, of their, um, how do you say, their credit. So they'll, they would look, then look at the standards and say, you know what, in this I can learn, I can learn about biology, I can learn anatomy, I can learn history, I can get, I can get this, this credit, this credit, this credit, and they can go through and they can check off. And the way we're setting it up is that that student would then come to, you know, come to like, you know, present it as similar to somebody who was doing like a thesis, um, you know, or dissertation, defending their dissertation. You know, I believe that by participating in this project, by doing this and learning these things, I'm gonna get these, these you know, these standards met. And then, you know, the whoever's there, that would probably be, yes, us or you, Fawn, if you're gonna come and help us do math. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be whoever is like, okay, you know what? I think you are gonna meet those those science standards if you know if you're if you can identify these parts when we get in when we're butchering mm -hmm. the buffalo. If you can go, I mean, obviously you've you've met that standard check. And then, you know, and that's how they would then yeah. they, they would then meet meet their goals. Like 
if there were students who wanted to go out and do that hunting part, they could get all their, you know, like a lot of their physics done, wind velocity, speed, checking the size of the animal, the size of the bullet, the size of the gun, the, you know, how the land is looking. All of that is science, the stars, when to go out, that's astronomy. There's like, there's, there's education happening all the time. And what colonization has te taught us is that you, you're only learning or you're only being successful in the system if you're sitting down, opening a book and doing these problems. It's so much more than that. And to get away from that and to say, to have students say, you know what? Our community needs this and this, this would be a solution that I can do. And then all we have to do is then support that student to, to, you know, to create that solution. And in that process of, that, of the student creating that solution, they then can also be you know, learning about the science behind that. They can be learning, you know, like, I, like I've already mm -hmm. given examples, but they, they, this, these don't have to be separate things. They don't have to wait till they're like me in their mid forties and saying, you know what, our community needs this and not, I think I can do this. Because I had to go through this whole system before I figured that out. Like, let's get away hey, from that. Hey. We can totally dismantle that. And, you know, so Wadukhti, you know, he's what, eight, seven? Seven. <laughs> seven. <laughs> so imagine, like, he's like in the next year, he's like, you know, he's a, he's, he can start creating those solutions. He can, um, you know, get his, ma his math work, his reading work. He can knock all of that out. We can do that. We're, we're that smart. And it's, and it's cool that you brought up the story about having um, fun about those students, like being engaged and listening to um, she, she, Courtney talk about the white buffalo calf woman and they saw, you know, and when she came, because they always say, I've always heard in ceremony, like if you get a lump in your throat, when you hear our traditional songs, or if you hear an elder sing, or if you feel, you know, whatever you feel from it, it's because it's not the first time you've ever heard it. It's not the first time you've ever felt it because this is a part of who each of us are. And so thinking of like how this school is, is not just, it's not going to be a school that, you know, like, like Chua just explained that it's, it's going to be dynamic, different types of learning and bringing back that, that kinship of how we interact with each other because I think so many times we are in this this race to the top or this race to do this or that or in competition of um you know who's this person's doing that project okay I'm gonna do this over here when literally we want this in every single community in every single household you know following um the Lakota Dakota ways whatever ways fit with with each family um and get it back to starting in the home and starting within our families because it's been stolen from us that, you know, to the point where it's not in every single family. And we're fortunate that our, our dads and moms, you know, grew up the way that they did so that we have it, but our peers, most, you know, a lot of them didn't. And so a part of the school too, aside from all the things that um, Camila and Sunshine, uh, Sunshine, I'd like you to share more too, but is that we want to bring back that, that kinship system of, of vouching for each other and being able to speak on behalf of each other where you know it's not a tradition for us to be talking about all our accolades and all the things that we've done and this and that but through this school process if there's a student who knows everything about a buffalo and can you know tear that buffalo down offer it to each of their relatives be able to you know dice it up use all the bones <laughs> use the horns use all the things and have an, have an elder say, yeah, this student, you know, this person did this, this, and this without even being asked. They offered it to their relatives. They taught students how to dry meat, you know, like all the things that these students will accomplish. We want our community to be speaking on behalf of them and sharing all the good things that they've done because I think we've gotten away from that too. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a lot of things that we've been imagining for the last four years since camp closed and it's been um an eye-opening process for us because when camp happened we've all like 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 we said we were deep you know we had our lives split up in these different sections and it's the same way we we viewed schooling and education and our lifestyles we had them split up but when camp happened it was like a time for us to realize like we don't even have to ask for permission. We don't, we don't even have to be living this way. We can, what? You know, like we can just yeah. go teach and practice by our own Lakota Dakota ways. We can use our own medicines instead of this. And so, you know, and so that, 
that's that was the biggest takeaway from we from the camp is that we were living these ways but we thought things had to be separate because our minds were still coming out of that and so when i think about like our youth who are excited to hear those stories or excited to learn about who we are i just encourage each and every one of you listening to continue to to lean into those those interests and those excite and those excitements for our ways because that's your your spirit guiding you back to that and because it's always been there and that's something that we're trying to express too like sunshine talked about reactivating because it's things within us that have always been there ways of um, being good relatives ways of living with the land but but we've been brainwashed for so long that we can't do these things and so camp really did that for me um, it helped me to see that I don't have to wait and ask for permission that except you know from our elders but I don't we don't have to ask for permission to live our who we are every day um, so yeah um, if it's okay if I build a little bit on what you're saying Elena um, like for us as Lakota people there's this value outside of wealth and monetary wealth but we have social capital and that's something that was put aside is like there's this great wealth and having good relationships and having good relationships not only directly benefits us but our community if like our community sees that what we're we're trying to to do what we can for the people around us and also a uh, major thing that we're shifting towards as the school is focused on non-hierarchical decision-making processes so that when uh like it's not top down as we're being described hierarchical is somebody telling us appointing or so but we're all collaborative in this uh round interconnected web and each one is impacted in every single thing that we do i think that um it's really uh, important for us to remember those teachings um, Elena, you said something that kind of stuck in my mind about um, asking permission. And I see Lacey from the chat wrote that too. And you know, um, at the time in No Dapple, I was a biologist. I was a land operations officer for Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in the land management department. And I worked really closely with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And what I got to learn was um, Bureau, the reason Bureau of Indian Affairs is on our reservations is because we were deemed incompetent. To make our own decisions that's why they're there to make decisions on behalf of us because we may not understand the land the laws all that so i really became resentful of that um and what i was one thing i always bring up and one reason i'm help i'm trying to uh, get this wind farm started is um once no dapple had had happened excuse me i saw a change in our people you know they used to come to me for help and say, um, I want a home site on my land. Can I do this? And they're asking me permission. And I'm like, yeah, it's your land, you know. But when No Dapple happened, the change I saw was, okay, I have 80 acres and I'm going to do this. Like, tell me, you know, what I need to do to do this. So because there is some like red tape that happens because land is in trust. So not only they were asking for my help to get through that red tape, but they were saying, I'm doing this. So I was so happy. It was just, it almost brings me to tears to tell, tell that right now, because I was like, there's that change in our, um, you know, everyone took, per they didn't stop asking permission and they took ownership of their own lives. So I'm, I'm very thankful just that um, the empowerment our people felt after No Dabble. Um, we do have a, if, I don't know if someone would like to quickly answer this, we have a question from Lacey in the chat, and she wants to know how we received our Lakota names. Does anyone want to take the lead on that? Um, so I'm not sure if it's specific for like how we did, or if it's asking like, how do you go about that? Um, because each of us got our names from our families. Um, and usually it's a name that's passed down from your family or like in the case of um, two of my children, they got it in ceremony. Um, and there's different protocols for that. And I'm not sure if there's someone in your family that could help you with that. But if there isn't, I really do think that that's an important topic too, because when we were doing, um, when we were being mentored under uh, Lexi J, 
uh, who recently passed, he had started that up in the McLaughlin school system where he was, and he had a gift to do that. Um, and so I guess I'm not sure how it works in each community, but I think thinking about how elders in our communities or knowledge keepers in our communities can re revitalize that practice and reclaim that practice within our communities or within our schools or because like she um, would ask the students a series of questions and then his own gift um, paired with with what he felt with those students he would ask them um, he, he would then come up with a name and so to me that was really powerful and I think that that's a practice that um, our people can do and but it has to be those ones with those gifts and so I'm not sure what that looks like in um, for you Lacey but that's an example of how it works. Yeah in my family um, we all we were all named as children and we were all given um, our an ancestral names like I, I said in the beginning I was named after my great-grandmother Catherine Agard um, and we were all given so those names will live on basically and I know some of my um, nieces, my own nieces and nephews, my own children have been given names from our own Chilshpaye, um, who was, I'm, I'm a descendant of Chief Thunderhawk, like who was in his camp? We would, we claim relationship with them. So we, we name our kids after them. But in other aspects too, um, you, earn, you can earn a name. Like my brothers each have multiple names for which they earned and they were given them by, um, either tribal leaders or um, medicine men. So that's, that's just how it happened in my family. I think every family is different, but um, Sunshine, did you have anything to add to that? Um, for me, I was given mine through a, interest, a ceremony with an elder on a different reservation because my family didn't grow up really traditional. A lot like my, they were ranchers and agriculture families mostly um, in the recent generations. And so when I was doing a horse medicine research project and um, elder who was teaching me the plants in Crow Creek um, said that the little people shared a name that they called me. And that's where I've um, decided to honor that in my life. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I think we're, you know, getting close on the end of our time here, but I would like to throw one more question at you guys. Um, what is the enduring impact of no dapple? Uh, Elena, do you want to, we'll just keep going in our round robin here and we'll start with Elena, then go to Kim, Kimmy and then Sunshine. Um, I think <clears throat> when I think of the, the long-term impact, I think of how, um, it really brought us together. It made us realize that we're not different from each other. We're not, um, we're not in a separate fight against, you know, oil, fossil fuels and uh, politicians who want to destroy and continue to take our land. And also, you know, scholars who want to extract knowledges and all these things. We're not in different fights that we're all together and how we move forward. Um, in a good way alongside each other is is really important and really leaning into those uh traditional ways of of midakuye owasi i think that that has been my biggest i don't know impact of this of th thinking of how we really are all related and that the things that have happened to us the things that we've perpetuated in our own lives in our own communities was by design and to have forgiveness of yourself and not to continue that violence towards yourself or your family or anybody else, like it can stop now and we can continue to work together in a good way and in a loving way um, here and moving forward. The enduring impact of Nodapo. I think the, to, um, just to continue with Mitra, what Mitra was saying, um, I, I I always try to think of how to how to say this the best because there's so many I feel like there's this been this huge ripple effect that's gone that's happened all over the world um, and the mo 
the most powerful part about that is that um you know it started with young people <laughs> like it was like young people here on standing rock like it was some of the young people from wakabala who said hey let's run out to let's run out to washington dc and they just start running you know that's that's how powerful our young people are and um that ripple that ripple effect is so powerful because I think it's taught people that no matter who you are, even if you're from one of the poorest countries in the United States, and if you're from middle of nowhere America, where for the first four decades of my life, when I said I'm from Sunny Rock, nobody had any idea. Like, I never met anyone from South Dakota before. Let me stop. But it, the endearing impact is that now when young people say they're from Sunny Rock, everyone knows. And they did that. That was like their voice. They just, so no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, your voice is powerful. So it was just remembering that nobility of spirit that we're all powerful, noble people. Yeah, it can be like, I, you know, I have a little movie night with my kids every weekend just because we're in isolation so much and we can't go to movies anymore. So, my kids wanted to rent the movie New Mutants. It's a next generation, like X-Men type movie. And there's a mutant on there that's from Standing Rock and she's Native American. So we even made it into like a mainstream movie. It's crazy. My, all my kids were like, ah, you know, just like, just in shock. But um, Sunshine, how about you? It's really interesting because it's kind of the same thing. Our reservation is unique because it's from two, it's on two states. So I feel like we're, our jurisdiction, we're following state law from North Dakota, South Dakota. We're following tribal law, federal law. We're like all these things we have to take into consideration when we're trying to move projects forward. Which state line do we want to cross in order to decide these things? And um, I guess the complexities of, um, the uh, police policing the reservation makes some of these things difficult, but uh, since since the um, camp happened, I have noticed that a lot of cultures um, have also been activated to use their voice for thing uh, uh, righteous righteous practices to be happening in their own territories, you know, across the globe. And I feel like even though from camp, I'm like, well, it didn't even work. They put the pipeline in, but it did in a different way. And I feel like some of that is bridging these bigger projects like the wind farm project and how um, we can in the future use, you know, uh, shift our dependency from fossil fuels to something that's renewable and that's continuously generating itself and put, uh, potential growth for economic revenue for our people to have more independence as a sovereign nation. Absolutely. Thank you, Sunshine. Um, totally. Like I, you know, I think of the enduring impact of No Dabble and I'm like, uh, you can say we were a failure because they filled the pipe anyway, but you got to look at it from different aspects. Think of the impact we made on the world. There was a worldwide movement. Like now everyone's thinking about how can I live more sustainably? How can, um, how can I, I live in a way so I'm not going to hurt, hurt Ujimaka, you know? Um, and then Kimmy, just to follow up with something that you said about, it was our youth that actually started this. And that's, um, I've been on, I'm on the SAGE board and um, I've, I've been in talks with the rest of our representatives here to actually get um, some type of youth leadership on our board as well. Cause I want, I want to know what our youth are thinking. I, I can play a guessing game and you know I work in a middle school and it just it perplexes me the the amount of information our students soak in and know and I'm like I I don't give them enough credit so I I need to stop doing that but I would really like a youth representative on our board to give us give us that perspective even if we'd have to change some bylaws or something but even if you know it's just in an advisory position um so I'm going to ask you ladies a couple more questions. Um, what were some positive experiences or benefits of the camp for the students? Um, and how can SAGE's resources 
um, from the renewable energy projects and projects similar to this help the Mini Wichoni School. Go ahead, Sunshine. Hey. <laughs> Okay, hey, I'm going to repeat that. So basically, how can these projects benefit the use of our future? And uh, our, we recently, one of Kimimala's students of the past joined our team, who's this awesome engineer. And we super needed like a project manager because all of us are like, oh, this is a great dream, but we don't really know engineer things, like how to like develop things very well. But knowing that there's people no. from our community that are already building these skills no. and are interested in developing opportunity for other youth to activate this, um, you know, uh, understand alternative technology and how we can, we can design systems to um, be more aligned with earth, earth centered practices and not centering ourselves, but you know, centering the earth. I better stop, my kid has scissors, go on. <laughs> Safety first. Um, how about you, Elena? What were yeah, some positive experiences of the camp? And then um, how can projects like this um, help, pro um, like the SAGE project, help something like the Mini Wichoni School? I think that all of us coming together and being able to say the same thing, which is that we, you know, we want to act, reactivate our traditional Lakota Dakota ways within our communities, which includes taking care of our environment. And I think being able to say the same things that we want, like having our students be really conscious about how um, not only our students, but their, their family members be conscious of how they're treating the environment, the things that we're witnessing, you know, we all are trying to have cars and we all think of electricity and propane and, you know, all these things are constant in our communities because in one way or another, we either run out of propane or we don't have electricity or our water is not working or, you know, all these things that we depend on an outside source to, to take care of for us. And so I think really focusing on how these organizations that whether they were born out of no daffle or or the water's life movement whether the whether they were born out of that or it is from our our people you know getting degrees seeing what it is that's possible and bringing it back like these all need to be ways that our communities can keep helping and thriving for the sake of our people and so when i think of of the school and the wind farm and the, and the mini Wichoni clinic and farm and all these other organizations that are, that were created and that are continuing to be developed. I think being able to um, work together in a good way and to say the same things. I know I just said that, but I think about when I say, say the th same things, I think about our treaties and how it's been really hard for us to get on the same page with them because we all have different interpretations. We all have different parts of, um, of you know, the trees that we want to focus on or the, the ways that we want to approach it and really getting together as, as community members to decide what it is that our community sh needs and could and should be doing um, for the sake of education and healthcare. I think that that's a, an, an important factor in, in how we can use our, you know, our relationships and our social capital to be able to support each other through this like really reciprocal way. Like if the wind farm is generating all this um, revenue from the, the wind and the, the resources that is coming from that, that it could support the school in, in, in whatever ways that are needed. Or if the school could be developing programs that could train uh, students and their families and working in the wind farm, then how could we be doing things like that? You know, if there's students that are um, interested in a certain topic. How can we use the resources we have for all these different organizations and projects that are on Standing Rock to, to build our communities up and not outsource all of these things all the time, but use the, the people and the um, intelligence, the genius that we have within our own communities. Thank you. Kimmy, did you have anything to add, add to this? Elena yeah. said it, that's, that's it. That's, yep. Yeah. Great answer. Huh? Again. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I, we had a comment slash question here from Rachel from Reba and it says, 
how are you thinking about relationship between Wind Farm Project and the school? And I'd like to take a um, crack at that. Just you guys kind of answered it, but um, the SAGE and the Ambetuwe Project, SAGE Development Authority, we are not for profit. So once we get the wind farm up and running, um, revenues are going to be going to not only um, reclamation to our project sites eventually, but to self-determination for Standing Rock. Um, we want to help help our people basically and um, get get this ball rolling because I what I said earlier was you know I saw that change in people's um, thinking what between like when I worked at land management between like okay um, can I do this on my land versus I'm going to do this on my land you know it, that empowerment and I just want to like snowball that effect with our Lakota people our Lakota Dakota people here who live on Standing Rock and and we need to, um, you know, our strategic planning sessions for Sage Development Authority were amazing. I was so happy to be in them because we looked out seven generations, 500 years, what kind of future can we make for our people? And that's our ultimate goal is, you know, we, we took that saying from our, our Lakota chiefs, Chief Sitting Bull is, um, what can we do to make, make this world a better place for our children? And that's what the ball we went with is, um, so we want to, when we get the wind farm up and running eventually, we want to be able to help projects like this, the, um, the school. And, um, you know, we've thought about other things too, museums. We have so much um, of our own family uh, heritage sitting in museums right now, um, ancestors sitting in museums right now that we want um, power over, I shouldn't say power, that's not the right word, but we, we want to take initiative to take care of that stuff now. Um, it, it, it's ours, it belongs to us. And so we want to help build a museum on Standing Rock so we can teach others, we can teach our own families. Um, there's, and you know, it's endless, the opportunities that we have out there to make this world a better place for our people. Um, but our, looks like our time has ended. And um, I just want to remind everyone that there is, um, if they could just, if you would like to donate, you can go to ambetuwe.com forward slash donate. Um, we are also listed on the donation site for our Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. So if you would go to standingrock.org. Um, and then you can follow us on social media as well. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, links are on the site. So before we end the call, does anyone else want to share any last lasting sentiments here? Just thanks for tuning in. Our website is forthcoming really soon. But you can find us on Facebook, Mini We Chani Nakijaze Wotun Spay. Oh huh. Awesome. Okay. Thank you everyone. Bye. Look shake. Look shake.